This is the 10th in a series of lectures on differential geometry. In our last lecture, we looked at the microscopic picture of a Lie group. We examined it by standing at the identity element and trying to understand how to look at it in the small. Um, we took its tangent space at the identity and showed that we could put an algebra structure on that tangent space. In this lecture, we want to go from the small to the large. We want to try to see to what extent can we capture the large-scale picture of the Lie group in terms of that, that small-scale algebra information. As a first step towards going from small to large, we want to go back and think about these left invariant vector fields. We started by taking a tangent vector at the identity element in, in a Lie group, and we moved it around by using left translation to be defined at every point, to extend to a, a left invariant vector field everywhere on the group. So. Um, so we want to try and understand the behavior of those. And the first result is that um, every left invariant vector field, and it's the same, of course, for right invariant, uh, every left invariant vector field is complete. What does it mean for a vector field to be complete? It means that you can flow along it forever. Some vector fields are incomplete. For example, on the unit interval, if we took the vector field which is translation in the x variable on the x-axis, um, we'd, we'd finite time run to the or to the end of it. So it's possible to have a vector field on a manifold and then uh, run off the edge of the manifold in finite time. So we want to say that doesn't happen with left invariant vector fields. And the reason is sort of geometrically clear. If you take the left invariant vector field and you follow along a flow line for some time, so you have a flow line which is defined for some time, you can left translate the whole flow line. You get the same vector field, and you get the flow line defined for the same time. So the amount of time during which the flow is defined is the same everywhere. Wherever you are, there's the same amount of flow line time here as there is here, because the left translation matches them up, and the left translation inverse reverses the picture. So it's exactly the same amount of time of flow everywhere. And uh, that means that no matter where you are, you still have just as much time left to keep flowing as you had before. Um, because if I'm standing at some point here and, and flow along, wherever I end up, I end up at some point here. But I still have the same amount of time. I have, say, this amount of time, however much time it took me to go along that, uh, that trek. Uh, however much time that took, I still have at least that much time left to keep going again because the left invariant vector field continues to have the same amount of time left over. And so if there's some time epsilon during which the flow is defined from this point, there's the same time epsilon which is defined from that point, and so on. And you keep going adding up epsilon plus epsilon plus epsilon and so on to infinite time. So that shows that the vector field is actually complete. This is, encourages us to define a smooth map, which is called the exponential map, and which is defined uh, as follows. Um, we take uh, any element of the Lie algebra and we map it to uh, the flow uh, at time uh, t equals 1 uh, through uh, the point 1 um, with velocity, uh, well, let's say, of the vector field, the less invariant vector field corresponding to it. And so that's what we'll call the exponential map. It's going to be a maps to a point, which we'll call e to the a, and it's well defined. Now, we of course wonder why we would define it, why we would call it exponential map. Um, the, um, the, the obvious observation is that it should be, of course, the case that uh, uh, in an example, uh, uh, if we take uh, our group G to be, as usual, G, L, and K, where little k is either the real numbers, complex numbers, or quaternions, then um, then the left invariant vector field was uh, simply uh, this guy. So its flow equation is um, is the equation you know, g dot at time t is you know, g a of well sorry g g of t a let's put it that way. Um, and you can then check that um, if you multiply by g inverse you get g inverse let's say g inverse dg dt is a. And that, uh, if you set g of 0 to be 1, if g of 0 is, is the identity element, then you can easily see 
that this uh, equation is satisfied just exactly by the exponential map uh, in, in the case of, of, uh, of, a, of, of matrices. So e to the a is exactly the exponential of matrices. Um, so again, we're, we're working here with the Lie group, which is just the group of all the matrices. We calculate out the explicitly the, the, the left invariant vector field. We did that last time. And then, um, then we find just that um, the equation of flowing along the flow line of that vector field is just this equation. And that just says the derivative of the logarithmic derivative of g is a, and so it's the exponential of a. So, or in other words, um, g of t is exactly e to the t a. So that's an example that motivates the, this being called an exponential map. Um, we've computed out the exponential map um, in this case. It's just the exponential of matrices. Remember, the exponential of matrices is e to the a is identity plus a um, plus a squared over 2 factorial plus a cubed over 3 factorial plus dot dot dot. And I've left you the, the um, uh, to deal with the issue of, uh, of proving that this is smooth and that it's actually uh, well defined for any matrix A. So that there isn't really a problem with this definition. Um, so we can see that it's really the exponential that we're dealing with. Um, so that explains why it's called an exponential, uh, although to be uh, to be precise, I I there are Lie groups for which the exponential map uh, really isn't somehow naturally thought of as an exponential. It is say when you, there are examples in the notes where you can calculate the exponential in coordinates and it doesn't turn out to give you some kind of of uh, expression involving exponentials um, of the numbers. So it, it it's a bit of an odd name, but um, but it does have some reasonable properties um, on any Lie group. Uh, any Lie group G, if we have this exponential map, and it takes the Lie algebra to the Lie group, um, defined again by just taking any A in the Lie algebra to uh, time one flow of A uh, through the point one in the group. You start at point one and you flow along the left invariant vector field of the left invariant vector field, um, and you flow for time one. So that's the definition of it. Um, so a uh, trivial observation about it is that it's, uh, is that it's going to take then um, the exponential of zero is the identity matrix because by definition you flow zero flow for whatever time you stay where you were. Um, and the um, less obvious a fact is that the exponential at zero derivative, the exponential map at zero assigned to any vector is that vector, um, which I'll leave you to, to check um, by unwinding the definitions. One particular uh, remark about it is that if you pick any particular a and you fix it, and then you map t goes to the exponential of t a, which again I'll also write as e to the t a, um, then uh, you find that uh, this guy uh, is, is actually a subgroup. This is actually a map r goes to G, and it's actually a, a morphism of groups. It, that sort of morphism is called a one-parameter subgroup. A one-parameter subgroup, even though it may not be embedded as a, as a subgroup, is, uh, is a morphism of groups from the real numbers to, to the group G, which is given by this sort of expression. You take one particular tangent vector in G, and then you exponentiate t times that tangent vector. It gives you, uh, for each time t, it gives you a, um, an element of g. In other words, it's just the time t flow. That's the time t flow if you start off with velocity a. Um, so that's the um, definition of a one-parameter subgroup. Now, um, we have the uh, elementary fact about exponential maps. Um, which is uh, trivial to, uh, mod to, to, um, to check for the matrix case that we're always, uh, is, our, is always our main interest. And this is that, uh, the, um, that uh, if we have a, let's say, a morphism of Lie groups, of, oops, sorry, Lie groups, given a morphism of Lie groups um, and uh, with G, Connected, then um, uh, then 
it's uniquely determined by uh, its derivative at the identity element, which takes the uh, tangent space of the identity to the tangent space of the identity. And again, I'm using these funny uh, German letters to represent tangent space at the identity and tangent space at the identity. Um, so, um, and also, uh, this um, phi prime at the identity is a Lie algebra morph. Well, let's say it's just an algebra morphism. Algebra morphism. What do I mean by an algebra morphism? It matches up algebra structure. And what is the algebra structure? The algebra structure is the bracket. It, well, it, it makes um, sums to sums. It's linear, after all. It's a linear map. We already know that. Um, uh, it's, after all, it's the derivative, uh, the linear approximation. And um, also, though, that it takes multiplication, multiplication. And the multiplication for us is this bracket operation. So, um, so that's what we mean by an algebra morphism. Um, so it's an algebra morphism, and um, uh, and we also want to say that uh, one parameter subgroups, as part of our theorem, one parameter subgroups are matched up. Subgroups, one parameter subgroups uh, will be matched up by satisfying that. Um, uh, phi of one parameter subgroup e to the ta is e, uh, so e to the t phi prime of one a. Uh, so we match up the velocity vector and then we just flow along. Okay, so um, let's see if we can prove that. Uh, so. Um, prove. Um, so what we're going to do is we're going to say then, okay, we start with the fact it's a group morphism. Okay, and then what we want to do is uh, therefore say it so uh, preserves left translation and right translation. Because left translation is a group operation. So the left translation operators are le become left translation operators. Um, <laughs> so then, um, if uh, H naught is phi of G naught, we get uh, that uh, phi of G naught e to the T A is H naught phi of e to the T A. And then if we differentiate that, this is the left translation uh, here, it's the left translation here, differentiate, and you simply get that the uh, the um, derivative of this guy applied to the left invariant vector field whose flow is, after all, this guy. That's the flow of this left invariant vector field at the point G0. And it should be then corresponding to this guy, which is um, uh, left translation H0 prime at identity times um, phi times, uh, what do I want to say, times um, uh, phi prime at the identity times uh, a vector of g naught uh, differentiating. So it's uh, so it matches these things up. Okay. So uh, so what it, it's going it's going to happen then is if we set so we let b be phi prime at identity a, then what we find is that phi star vector a is vector b. The vector fields are matched up. So it matches up left invariant vector fields with left invariant vector fields. It might be easier just to say intuitively it's pretty much obvious that um, if it preserves left translations, the left translation is how we defined the left invariant vector fields. So it must take left invariant vector fields to left invariant vector fields. Um, um, so uh, left invariant vector field brackets must, must be matched up. If, if we have corresponding, we proved previously, if we have corresponding vector fields under any smooth map, then uh, in this case phi, then their brackets match up. And so uh, phi star as bracket uh, matching. And so um, so phi 1 prime is a Lie algebra, or an algebra morphism, matches up the brackets. Um, 
it's already linear, and now it matches up brackets. Okay, so um, so now we um, we get the one also well, the one parameter subgroups matching up um, because the flows of these things are the one parameter subgroups. The one parameter subgroups match up. Um, v star vector a is vector b. Well, this let's say yeah vector b, and then implies that um, flows match. If the vector fields match, the flows match. Um, so that implies that the one parameter subgroups, which are the flows through the identity, they match. Um, so that gives us all the one parameter subgroups matched up. And then um, on the other hand, if you have um, if you have some phi naught and some phi one, uh, to g to h are Lie group morphisms. Uh, with uh, the property that they agree at the identity, uh, that implies that they uh, match up the exponentials. Um, so um, phi naught of e to the ta equals phi one of e to the ta. Uh, they have to match. And then um, uh, you can see that um, they match uh, these exponentials, uh, well, as we said, we said exponential prime of zero is the identity. So exponential um, is on to some open set around uh, the identity element. Because it's the derivative of this thing is the identity map, it's a local diffeomorphism near zero. And to be a local diffeomorphism means, therefore, it would take an open set to an open set where it's a diffeomorphism. So this map will have will take a small open set around the origin to a small open set around the identity, um, and therefore uh, we get um, that uh, this equation has to hold for anything of the form of an exponential, but things of the form of an exponential form an open set. So we've got this exponential, which is taking the Lie algebra to the group, it's taking zero to the identity, and we've said that it's a diffeomorphism of some neighborhood somewhere around there to some neighborhood somewhere around here. Um, and so it must be, um, uh, must have open image. And so what we found is therefore that um, we found that phi naught and phi one, we had two such morphisms, uh, so phi naught, phi one agree near uh, the identity element in our group because we've seen that they agree on exponentials, and those fill up a, a neighborhood of the identity, an open set around the identity. And so um, phi naught equals phi one, because uh, the points where they agree, or morphisms agree, have to form a normal subgroup. And that normal subgroup has to be has to contain an open set, um, uh, g, uh, well, on some uh, a normal subgroup, let's say on some normal subgroup, Containing, uh, uh, containing an open set, um, but uh, so by our first result that implies that a, a phi naught equals phi one on uh, union of components because open set inside a subgroup so it contains an open set has to contain components so uh, on a union of components. Uh, but we said G was connected. Um, so uh, the only components we have, they're just one component. So they have to agree there, the component of the identity. Okay, so that implies that the, that uh, once you know, um, for a connected group, once you know what happens on its Lie algebra, you know what happens in the whole group. Um, and that's uh, covering a lot of cases because we said that for the most part, we can usually work just with connected Lie groups. So here's a, a an, an elementary... Um, uh, observation about um, one parameter subgroups that if we have uh, so we have G and H and a morphism of Lie groups and um, uh, some phi and uh, then we want to say that um, a vector lies in the kernel of the derivative of the map if and only if um, uh, the, um, uh, the 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 set of all e to the ta's uh, uh, lies in the kernel, uh, the kernel of phi, 
Um, so we're saying if you kill the velocity of a one-parameter subgroup, you kill the whole one-parameter subgroup. And um, uh, so so the, this direction is easy. If you kill the whole one-parameter subgroup, you're going always to the same point. So e to the ta contained in the kernel of phi, that's exactly the same as saying, so we're doing this direction. Uh, e to the ta is contained in the kernel of phi, says exactly that um, phi of e to the ta is constantly equal to 1. Um, and that says, therefore, that phi is a constant map, so its derivative uh, is 0. Phi prime at uh, 0 uh, times a is 0. You differentiate, you take the velocity at the identity, and you get 0. Now, on the other hand, if you have this guy um, uh, in the kernel, then you want to go the other way. So we want to go the other way. Um, we suppose that uh, phi prime of a is 0, and then um, we need to we need to check that that this actually goes always to the identity element. Um, so um, the exponential map then um, is going to uh, going to have to um, match up uh, phi of e to the ta has to be we said uh, e to the t phi prime of one a that has to match up. Uh, the, the the velocities uh, have to match up and then and then you exponentiate. Um, uh, so this guy is zero and so this guy is one. Okay, so um, so that enables us to get somewhere uh, somewhere toward getting more of a of a global picture. We've understood that uh, we know uh, how to under how to work how to differentiate. If we had such a morphism, we could differentiate and get some kind of morphism of the Lie algebras. And we want to say that out of this, we can pretty much recover that, and we're getting closer. Okay, so now we've got this just for the one parameter subgroups. Let's look at uh, the bigger picture. We want to say uh, if we have, so our lemma is that um, we have, again, this uh, morphism of gr Lie groups and um, associated morphism of the algebras, algebra morphism on the Lie algebras. Um, then we want to say phi is an open map. That is to say, an open means that the image of an open set is open. Right? It takes opens to opens. It's called open. And that should happen if and only if phi prime of 1 is open. But uh, that just means, for a linear map, being open just means being onto. So we can check openness. This is the global topological condition just by differentiating and checking at this one point. Um, the proof is um, just that. Um, We'd like to say, well, use the exponential map, um, and that it's a local diffeomorphism. And so um, we look at phi of everything locally near the near the near the identity element looks like an exponential. Um, but that's this guy. Um, and so what we can see is that uh, this guy being an open map. Um, because the exponential is a, is a local diffeomorphism, this thing is basically you've got a local diffeomorphism and you're looking at phi. Um, and so you can see that this guy uh, being uh, onto is just, is just uh, or being, uh, oh, let's say, an open map, take, uh, have an open image of an open set near the origin, is just this guy having that property. And that, because this is a local diffeomorphism, is exactly this guy having that property. So, uh, so phi looks like, in in the appropriate description after this uh, this this diffeomorphism here, really looks looks like this guy, uh, before this diffeomorphism here. So, phi is open uh, near the identity uh, near zero. I'm uh, sorry, near the identity element, if and only if um, phi prime of one is uh, on two. Okay, so that that does a, only a microscopic picture. We need to get away from the identity element. Um, away from the identity element, what do we do? Um, we take some kind of left translation. Um, phi of left translated element is phi of g naught phi of g. And, um, and then use the fact that left translation is a diffeomorphism. Um, so I won't give all the details. But uh, since we can do it near the identity, um, we say that phi 
and phi prime are basically conjugated by putting an exponential on this side or an exponential on that side. It makes them look the same. And so this guy being open mapping is the same as that one being open, which is being onto. But that, that was on, only working at the identity where these things really are conjugated by some exponentials. Um, but uh, away from the identity, you can use left translation to make everything look like what happens at the identity. So I won't give more detail than that. Okay, so we want to determine when are the two Lie groups the same, and we want to use as little data as possible. If you think about the microscopic picture, so um, so we have a big theorem, we can put all this stuff together that we've done so far, and say that, uh, supposing we have some phi, it takes some g to h, it's a Lie group morphism, and um, uh, then these following are equivalent, we're going to say this guy takes, let's say, g to h as an isomorphism, a linear isomorphism, isomorphism of a vector space is this condition is the equivalent to the condition that uh, phi takes, well, phi takes, let's say, g to h is a covering map. Call that's a topological condition um, of being a very, very nicely behaved map uh, to its image. Its image, and the image is a uh, union of path components. So, uh, so it really looks somehow like like a picture of some kind of very simple object, and then somehow this is going to be covering uh, this. Um, so it looks very simple um, uh, when this happens. Um, and uh, so this is a condition is equivalent to this one. Um, in particular, uh, if this happens, uh, then uh, so should this happen, uh, phi is an isomorphism if and only if uh, one it has uh, image in every um, every path component or component uh, but the same uh, of H. So that means you get all the components out, right? You're not missing any, and then uh, n trivial kernel. And two, uh, kernel of phi is just one. Okay, so that's a condition for saying that the two things are the same. We want to say when are two Lie groups the same. If you can write down some map between them, differentiate it, and find that you get a linear isomorphism uh, on the on the tangent spaces, you're almost there. Um, you've got a covering map and to the image, and the image is a union of path components of H. So um, you just have to make sure you hit all the com path components. And you have to make sure that, that the covering map is a trivial covering map. You know this kernel is now going to be some discrete subgroup of G, but you want to make sure that it's just exactly the identity element, and then you can make then you can see it's going to be an isomorphism. So this gives you injective, this gives you surjective. So the, the, the proof of the of this is is very straightforward. Um, uh, if we start with a linear isomorphism, well, I mean, the other this direction is trivial because if it's just a covering map to its image, then then it's 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 surjective uh, near the origin, and therefore it's uh, it's derivative as, as as well. So covering map is no problem that way. Um, the 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 other direction then, um, how do we see that? Well, um, what we can see is that the image, uh, because this is a linear isomorphism, the image will contain an open set in H, so the image is a union of path components. Um, so what we need to do then is to figure out why it's a covering map, not just a not just a nice smooth map. So we can always just replace H by the uh, the set of components that are an image of, of phi. So without uh, loss of generality, we can always assume that it's onto. Um, and so we just have to figure out why is it a covering map. Now we we know that uh, the kernel, um, because this is a linear isomorphism. Uh, the, the the map here must be at least locally near the identity must be um, a covering map. It must be a it's a local diffeomorphism, and uh, so the kernel must be trivial or it must be sorry the kernel must be discrete. The kernel is discrete, and all you have to do is see that there's something about the kernel being one. Um, uh, so the kernel is discrete, and we can replace G by its quotient by the kernel because we know that um, if you replace G by uh, G modulo, the kernel of phi, that's fine. This is a discrete subgroup, so it's closed. It's a normal subgroup by definition being a kernel. So this is a Lie group, this quotient. And so we're safe in replacing G by that quotient. 
we can always do that. And um, so, so now we're now we can work on that group, and we can assume therefore the cor that the kernel is trivial. We can assume that the map is 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 onto, and that the kernel is trivial. In particular, it's, it's now an isomorphism of groups. Um, now, because phi is uh, uh, phi prime is is the identity, it's a it's a it's a local diffeomorphism near any point. And now we just have to left translate and see that uh, that the map is uh, is going to have a, a decent inverse everywhere. Um, so it's it's going to be invertible locally near the identity because of the fact that this guy is a, is a linear isomorphism. We can then reverse the take logarithms, so to speak, to reverse our exponentials, and then see that it's going to match up. Um, it's going to be a, a, a diffeomorphism near the identity, and then uh, we can then left translate that uh, local uh, inverse to get a global inverse uh, defined everywhere, and so we get an isomorphism of groups. And uh, sorry, an isomorphism not just of groups, but an isomorphism of Lie groups. You can see the in, the inverse operation is everywhere very smooth. So going back over what we know, we know that once we can understand what's going on in, this, in the very small, the microscopic picture, we can understand the macroscopic picture very well, and um, and we can even see what additional data do we need globally to be able to conclude that we actually have an isomorphism of of Lie groups. Let's apply this in the baby case, where we're dealing with very simple Lie groups, very elementary Lie groups. Um, we want to think about Lie groups which don't have much complication to them. So let's think about Lie groups which have uh, the, the simple property of being abelian. Um, so a Lie group uh, G is abelian, um, if it's abelian as a group. Um, uh, as a group, in other words, the group model, model, model product uh, x y is y x. Uh, we'll say that the uh, the Lie algebra G is said to be abelian. This is a slightly weaker condition if um, the bracket of any two elements is zero. So the bracket just turns out to be the zero operation. So uh, so it's a slightly weaker condition. Um, it seems, um, but in fact, it turns out to be uh, for a connected group the same. Um, so suppose we have G connected, um, then uh, G is abelian if and only if German G is abelian. Um, and the proof is uh, is not too hard. Uh, let's start off with G abelian. So that means that x, y is y, x for any x and y. That means left translation by x um, is uh, right translation, uh, if you like. Or um, uh, so, um, But it also means that the left translation times x, left translation times y, is left translation y, left translation x. The left translations commute. Now the, um, the flows of the, of the left invariant vector fields are, 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 are these right translations, actually. Um, so we should maybe be doing this, uh, rx, ry, this ry, rx. The flows of, um, no, the flows of, uh, of the left invariant vector fields uh, uh, are, and I think I left that as another exercise for you to, 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 to check our, our right translations. Um, uh, so they commute. So they commute, and then um, so the brackets are uh, the brackets are trivial. Okay, um, we want to go back the other way. Um, that says so. This is sort of the easy bit. The global abelian implies the infinitesimal abelian. Right. This is uh, G's abelian, German G's abelian. So going from the big group to the little tiny infinitesimal Lie algebra is the sort of easy direction. The harder direction is going back the other way. Um, uh, so what we want to say is that um, if the if the Lie algebra is abelian, then uh, the flows commute. Um, if G is abelian, so we go back the other way. That means that the flows um, of the left invariant vector fields commute. Uh, low flows of lesson rate vector fields, co uh, sorry, commute, um, and uh, and and then, but if they they commute, they are the they're the right translations uh, near the identity. 
because the exponential map is on to, uh, those are the right translations of elements uh, uh, close to the identity. Because every left invariant vector with its flow is a right translation, and all the right translations uh, show up because they're uh, at least near the identity. All the elements near the identity, their right translations show up because they they're just exponentials. Um, so this makes sure that the right translations uh, of elements close to the identity commute, and therefore um, uh, the, um, uh, the 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 commuting elements. Um, Commuting elements, so commu commuting elements, uh, uh, you can can be multiplied to produce more commuting elements. Um, uh, so, uh, say near identity um, uh, uh, generate uh, a subgroup, and we know that it has to be a subgroup that contains components of all of G. Um, by a, the result we proved first in the first in this lecture, if you take all the elements near the identity, then um, they generate a subgroup, which gives us a union of components. Union of uh, of components of G. So uh, so G is made out of abelian uh, pieces. You may not have some non-abelian somewhere, but you, you're you're finding that at least near the identity. Uh, you've got a billion things, and then you just multiply them all together and keep going until you produce a group, and that's a billion. Okay, so that explains why billion groups are, are not so bad. Um, let's see if we can figure out how to classify them completely. Um, this result should enable us to completely determine what are all of the abelian groups. First of all, what are the abelian Lie algebras? This is sort of an obvious thing. We said that the that abelian Lie algebras. Um, that's exactly saying that the bracket of any two elements is zero, but you could just take V, any vector space, and then make the brackets of any things be zero, and you'd get an abelian Lie algebra. So the abelian Lie algebras are just the vector spaces. You take any vector space and make the brackets vanish. Um, so we then want to know what are the abelian Lie groups. And so here's the result. Um, uh, uh, well, let's write it as a theorem. Um, which I won't, uh, yeah, should be not a lemma, but a theorem. Um, uh, if G is connected, so let's say G connected abelian Lie group, um, uh, that happens exactly when uh, a G is a Euclidean space, uh, say RK, cross with a torus, or just some sort of T like this, uh, TL, where TL means circles multiplied together to make a torus. We said that was a Lie group, um, L of them. And then uh, RK, of course, is Euclidean space. Um, so how do we prove it? Um, uh, so first of all, what we do is we, we take the exponential map, and it takes G to G. Um, but actually, it, it's uh, strangely enough, it's a Lie group uh, homomorphism. Because um, it's going to take um, the, uh, it's going to exactly match up uh, the the uh, the laws of uh, of the uh, brackets here uh, with the with the multiplication. Well, the zero bracket is going to give it that the addition here becomes the multiplication here. Um, to to be to be a bit clear about that, what we mean then is that if we took some basis, um, we could write the elements of this vector space as some vectors, say x one dot 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 x in, uh, sorry, x1 dot 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 x, I gotta figure out whether they're going up or down now, um, and we could map them um, to, well, each one generates some one parameter subgroup, some kind of e to the t x1, yeah, sorry, e to the x1 times the associated uh, uh, phi uh, of, the ident of that map, Dot, 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 all multiplied e to the xn phi prime of en, where e, the e's are the standard basis vectors. This is in the group. Um, and this is in the in the Lie algebra. Um, so that what the exponential has to look like because these things all all expand out. And so it's a product of these one parameter subgroups. Um, and uh, so it's it's a, it's not hard to see then it must be a morphism. Everybody commutes, so it's all so it's a, so it's a morphism of groups. Um, so that gives us um, then that 
uh, if this is a morphism of groups, then and it's onto um, onto because um, we know that um, it's onto a neighborhood of the identity, and therefore must be onto um, if G is connected, it must be onto all of G by our again the same result we proved at the beginning of this lecture um, uh, that uh, the image has to be a union of components because it's got an open set inside it. So that gives us that this guy, when we exponentiate, uh, turns G into um, just G modulo, the kernel of the exponential map, uh, equals G. Um, and so now all you need to know is uh, how do we find, given a vector space with a trivial bracket on it, so just a vector space is usual addition law, and we quotient it by something, how do we prove the quotient is, is such a product? Um, and uh, it's done in detail in the notes. I don't want to go through it. What we're saying then is we take some vector space and we quotient by some uh, uh, by some subgroup, which is actually got to be a closed subgroup because of the exponential is going to be a continuous map, so its kernel is going to be closed. So it's going to take a vector space mod a closed subgroup, um, and I want to say that that must be a product of a vector space and a, and a torus, which is something that's, again, done in more detail in the in the lecture notes. Um, but it gives you the idea why it's true, because the brackets work out nicely. Um, everything's abelian, and when everything's abelian, you can just uh, take these exponentials and you just expand everything out. You get that it's just a, it's a group morphism. So, um, so what do we have? We have um, uh, identified all the abelian connected Lie groups. In the notes, we use this to give another proof of the fundamental theorem of algebra, um, which I'll maybe just outline a little bit here. Um, we don't want to go through all of it, but um, the idea then we can use this. It's we've already proven it previously, but um, uh, that uh, if uh, K containing R is a, field, a finite dimensional field extension. Uh, then uh, K is R or C. Uh, and our proof, essentially the idea is that um, um, we want to uh, say that uh, we could um, we could try to to to, um, to look at the at the non-zero elements as an abelian Lie group. Um, it's abelian because the field is as abelian multiplication. It's a Lie group because the multiplication is just a linear transformation of the uh, over the real numbers. Um, so then, what you can do is try to write out this. That this is this Lie group, but you also know that well. So again, k cross was defined to be k minus zero. Um, it's the non-zero elements, and so this is a vector space minus the origin. So we've done is taken a vector space k over the real numbers and deleted the origin from it. And so topologically, it's just uh, topologically, it's the positive real numbers crossed with a sphere. Um, um, and, uh, and topologically, that doesn't fit very well with what we said previously um, about abelian Lie groups having to be um, copies of the um, circles, this uh, torus uh, to some power crossed with some, let's say, p, uh, r, q. Um, so we have to somehow have this guy be um, a punctured vector space, so a product of a real reals in a sphere topologically, but it also has to topologically be this torus and this, this, this real thing. So uh, the, the topology is essentially uh, more or less that of a sphere in this picture, but a torus in this picture. And so if you try and work out why, why, when that's possible, of course, a one-dimensional sphere and a one-dimensional torus are both circles, so that works. But otherwise, it doesn't turn out to work so well. Um, so I won't give more details than that. Uh, so, so far, what we understand mostly is the, um, the, the notion of, of, of what happens when things are abelian. When, when, they, when the Lie algebra is non-abelian, we need to get a better relationship, a clearer relationship between how this exponential map fails to match things up. It turns out that, in general, the exponential um, is taking so it's taking Lie algebra to group, um, and it is taking some neighborhood of the of the of the origin in the Lie algebra to some neighborhood of the identity in the Lie group, and so it sort of wants to match them up. Um, 
and we'll see that that in some sense the bracket is uh, in this guy. So there's a bracket here. There's a multiplication here. They don't match up, but they come somehow close to matching up with some error terms, and those error terms are are, are somehow they're, they're they're quite fundamental in trying to understand how we can relate the infinitesimal story in the Li in in the Li algebra to the to the large scale story in the group. So that's what we'll look at more closely next time to try and really expand out how these things, these two operations are related under this map.